So we've had the first hour of the Tapas Project Shala completed where we've spoken about assessments. Now, like I said before, primarily the reason why we chose assessments to be the first thing that we addressed in project-based learning is to overcome the obstacle that a child's learning is not visible and it's not standardized when it comes to project-based learning. So I think now we've got an understanding, especially from what Rishi has said, in terms of what assessments can look like and how that can inform the practice of how the children are learning, especially to the facilitators or the teachers in the classroom, as well as the parents. So we can do this, guys. Now, our next speaker, and, and she's ready, she's smiling at me, and she's in the studio already, and I'm not going to spend too much time in, uh, in, before introducing her. So I'm going to just invite her on to join me. Hello, Holly, and a very, very good morning. I know that it's early morning for you. Good morning. I'm so glad to be with you, and I'm glad I got to listen to the speaker before me. <laughs> so hello, everybody. Welcome. So I'm going to take a couple of seconds to introduce my dear, dear friend, Holly. Uh, Holly Alyssa Bruno, MAJD. She's a best-selling, award-winning author and an international keynoter. She served as Maine's assistant attorney general as well as the academic dean at the University of Maine, Augusta, where she was selected as the outstanding professor. Her expertise is on emotionally intelligent leadership, managing legal risks, and leadership during traumatic times. Her sixth book, Happiness is Running Through the Streets to Find You, Translating Trauma's Harsh Legacy into Healing uh, by Exchange Press has been sold out immediately. And she is an alumna of Harvard University's Institute for Educational Management, and she has taught courses for Wheelock College, now part of Boston University, most recently in Singapore. Her first book, Leading on Purpose, was published by McGraw-Hill in 2008. Its sequel, What You Need to Lead, Emotional Intelligence in Practice has been one of NAEYC's bestsellers. Managing Legal Risks, Teachers College Press is another bestseller. The Comfort of Little Things received the Living Now Award for books in any field that uplift the quality of life. Her sixth book, like I mentioned earlier, is Happiness is Running Through the Streets to Find You, which is translating trauma's harsh legacy into healing. So, dear, dear Holly, a warm welcome once again, because I know that that things have been really hard for the last couple of years, now one, the last one and a half years, but you are somebody who gives hope, and you are so giving when you talk about hope. So, um, with, without much delay, I'm going to let you take over. So, I'm going to pop out of the broadcast and uh, let you continue talking and I will be controlling your slides. So let me know when you want me to move forward back with et cetera, et cetera. Ah, okay, thank you. So I'll just give you the sign. And also we have one hour, is that accurate or so give and take? Yes, about 45 minutes to one hour. Okay. If we have Perfect. questions, we will go towards the end of the session. Perfect, and what I was going to do, Preeti, if it's possible, is to, if people have questions during the time I'm talking, if something pops up, can you come back and let me know that? Yes, I will. Perfect, that way it'll be more interactive, which will be as illustrative of what we're talking about. So I'm ready to go and I'm grateful to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Hello, everyone. I am Holly Elisa Bruno and I'm coming to you from near Boston, Massachusetts, but in fact, it does and it doesn't matter where I'm coming from. I say that because education around the world has the same opportunities and the same challenges. And let me get down to something that's personal. And I invite you as I do this for you to get down to something personal as well. When you look back on your own education, what touched you the most? What mattered to you the most? And what helped you the most in your life? And how much of your education was what you had to do to make it through, to survive, to begin to start learning? I'll give you an example. I am 75 years old and, and I went to law school. I became a barrister. In some countries called a barrister, in some countries called an attorney. And that whole three years, I was required 
to do two things, to memorize, memorize and memorize, and also to learn a systematic way of thinking. The challenge was the systematic way of thinking like a lawyer was not true to me. And I struggled with it mightily. I struggled with it. I was being taught that the world was either right or wrong, that the world was either good or bad, that one client won and the other client failed. I was being taught that there was a winner and a loser. The law, the jurisprudence in England, which affects both India and United States says, there is a winner, there's a loser. The law does not look for how to make both parties whole. The law looks for who was the wrongdoer and who, is, who, who needs to be helped. And then the law talks about what's making that person whole that was helped. Well, guess what? I didn't enjoy that because my whole way of being is to see that, wait a minute, you're complex and complicated. I'm complex and complicated. The world is complex and complicated. It's not so simple as good, bad, either, or black, white. Oh my goodness. So three years I had to learn. And then are you ready for this? And some of you are in professions like this where you cannot practice. It's like children in school having to take the, the examinations. I could not become an attorney unless I passed a two day full eight hour each day examination. And so I might have done really well in law school. And in the end I did very well, but, but that doesn't matter. Everything depended upon this examination. So what does this have to do with project-based learning? Everything. Why? Because how did I make sense of law school? I called together fellow students. We were all adults. I was 27. Other people were in their early 20s. Some people were in their 30s. And, and I said, look, I need to make sense of this so that it makes sense to me. It's like project-based learning. It's like, wait a minute, you're teaching me all this stuff from the outside in, but what difference does it matter from the inside out? You can tell me what equity is. And I can say, okay, equity is blah, 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 the following cases. And I'll spit that back on the bar examination. But what really matters is, do I understand the vast difference between law and equity? And what's that about? That means bringing my own life experience my own understanding, my own feelings. Yes, education has a great deal to do with feelings. My own way of making this knowledge applicable. And that's what the former speaker was talking about. How do we make this applicable? And so for years of law school, what did I do? For years of law school, and by the way, I'm gonna ask Preeti if she can bring up the, uh, the PowerPoint as we're going through this. Thank you so much. Oh, that's just great. Yes, 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 yes. What was law school actually like? I'm going to tell you the truth. It was traumatizing. It was traumatizing because there was no room for me there. Look at the face of this beautiful child. Is there room for that child in your classroom if you're a teacher? Is there room for that child with such awe and wonder? in your home, if you've been homeschooling, not necessarily by choice, but by command. Yes, the awe, the wonder, the beauty that is in that child's eyes, that is what education needs to hold on to, not capture, but to, but to partner with. And that's what project-based learning is about. So how did I survive law school? I survived it by making sense of it myself, by talking it through with my own friends, by talking it through in my life, and by coming to understand, for example, that there are times, many times, when the letter of the law is not going to solve the problem. Yes, Yosef broke the law when he didn't pay his rent on time. And so the consequence is he loses his property. That's the law. End of story. Not end of story. I'm telling you right now about a true case that happened in England in the 12th century. Yosef, in fact, in fact, had paid his rent on time every single quarter. 
he had 13 children, you know, back in the day, that's what was common, 13 children to feed and to take care of and to educate, and they were all working for him. And he was a good community member. This one time when he didn't pay his rent on time and he got kicked off his property, what happened? The rains came down and the floods came up, the rains came down, the floods came up and he could not, and the bridges got wiped out. And this tenant could not make it across the stream to be able to pay his rent. And yet the law said, either or, you pay your rent or you get evicted. He and his family got displaced. And the community said, and that's law. That's what I was learning about law, the letter of the law. And yet came a case after this where the king heard how upset the community was. The king of England heard how upset the community was because they knew that fairness, that justice was not being accomplished. And so what did they do? They said, we can't live with this. And what did the king, he, this is not fair to this man. He's worked hard. He's, he's paid every year. He's paid on time. It was not his fault. It was, as the courts say, an act of law. And guess what happened? The king said, we now need something more. We now need to have a court of equity and a court of law. And first you go to the court of law. If the either or application of the law didn't fit, wasn't fair, didn't have justice, didn't have mercy, then you could appeal to the next level. And what was the next level? It was the court of equity. And equity meant looking at each person's circumstances. This is just like project-based learning. This is just like the theory of learning that says we have to, I have to, I've been a teacher for 50 years. I have to, I choose to. Look at that child and say, who is that child? What are that child's gifts? What does that child need to learn? Perhaps that child is, as my son is, otherwise able. My son has many learning challenges. And when he was put in the classroom and expected to learn like everyone else, he made a wreck of the classroom. Now, he wasn't an evil child. He wasn't a bad guy. In fact, he's brilliant but he couldn't learn in the traditional way. And so how did he survive? He didn't just survive, he thrived. When he had a classroom and a teacher who could build upon his learning style, build upon his strengths and look into his eyes, like I look into the eyes of this beautiful child and inspire and invite him to shine. And so here's what happened in the law, here's what happens in the classroom. What happened in the law is we realized People don't fall into simple categories, good, bad, either or, black, white, no. People are complex, learning is complex, people are individuals, learning is individualized, and guess what? Here's something else about project-based learning. Project-based learning invites us to learn in community. Now, how many of you, when you were, when you were in school, learned in community? How many of you had a project to work on with other students. And how many of you had that whole opportunity, which I didn't have, I'm from the traditional British based sage in the stage, person up front of the classroom talking. Yes. I, and I was supposed to memorize what she said, it was usually she until I got to the upper levels. And what did that prepare, prepare me for? You got it, it prepared me for the tests. Project-based learning, ready for this, prepares us for the tests of life. Traditional learning prepares us to pass academic tests. I'm gonna tell you the truth. Yes, I became a practicing attorney. Yes, I became an assistant attorney general. Yes, I became assistant dean at the University of Maine Law School. But before that, I had to take the bar exam. Did I pass the bar exam? Let me tell you about that. I took a group of people and I said, let's work together to prepare for this bar exam. The bar exam preparation course is really just about memorization. We've learned a lot of stuff. We'll be able to, to tell what we've learned and it's gonna cost a lot of money. And honestly, I was putting myself through law school. I did not have the money. And so a bunch of us got together, we helped each other through. 
and and we did really well. We 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 thought, and then we came to take the bar exam, and guess what? We didn't pass the bar. I say this to you in a way that felt very embarrassing, very shaming, but but the truth is. The next time we took the, the, the professors at the law school were extremely upset. We were good students. They went to the bar examiners. They went to the, 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 the they went to the, the people who, who um, made the exam and they said, something's wrong here. These are very good students. And guess what? We all caught on. We caught on that to survive, we had to pay and take that course because the bar exam was not about legal reasoning. It was not about understanding. It was not about applying what we had learned to situations. No, it was about, had we memorized things in the way that are needed to pass the bar exam? Did we know the right cases? Did we know the right series? It was not about creativity. It was about telling back. So with that introduction to the difference between Learning from the inside out and learning from the outside in, I can tell you that both processes are valuable. But if I want to learn for a lifetime, I need to have myself invested. And look, I'm talking about trauma. I'm talking about playfulness. When, I, when, when I'm talking about play, I don't mean just let's go outside and play. No, I'm talking about each child being invited to find her own connection in a way that excites her, to find her own connection with what we're studying. Oh my goodness, the last speaker was talking about the, the, the what, all those chemicals. I mean, I memorized that. What did that do? Nada. <laughs> What did it do? Not a, what excited me was when I was in my physics laboratory or my chemistry laboratory and I could put things together and see, oh, that's the marvel of what happens. And so let me summarize this and go on to the next slide and say to you that, look, let's look what Einstein said. We think of Einstein as being very traditionally academic. You know, no. He didn't do that well in school. He had a challenge. And look what he said. And Preeti, if you're there, I'm going to ask you if you can unmute and read us. What did Einstein say about learning? Everybody is a genius. If you judge a fish by its ability to climb the tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. And Preeti, what does that say to you about project-based learning and about engaging students? Each child is so different that we cannot have standardized testing. How It's not fair because we're treating all of them by the same uh, measurement and, and that's just not possible with human beings. And, and Preeti, what is going to happen to the child who does not learn in the way that other children learn? Oh, they will be demotivated, dejected, their self-esteem is going to drop really low. That, those effects are something that will last a whole lifetime. That's correct. And anyway, thank you so much, Preeti. And look, Einstein changed the world. Gandhi changed the world. And why? Because they made learning their own. So the challenge to us now is, and ne next slide, Preeti, how can we help children make learning their own? My son, my son is a very bright young man. Well, he'll be 38 Sunday. And yet he could not sit still in the classroom and memorize. He would say to me, mom, why? Why? This makes no sense. It makes no sense. Next slide, Preeti, if we could. Um, it makes no sense to me. And yet, and yet, when he had a teacher, now I'm gonna ask you, when my son had a teacher that listened to him and cared about him, and gave him projects or helped him as in the process isn't just about giving a child a project. The process of, of project based learning is we begin with defining Nicola, what do you need to learn? What are you excited about? Well, let's explore. Let's explore and let's plan for how you can learn about what you really want to know. What do you want to know? What do you want to know about how bridges are built? You want to build a bridge across a stream? Great. 
And so that's what you want to know. Well, let's see, what do you need to know? Well, you're going to need to know what's going to stand up if the river comes up. Remember our story of, of the, the tenant who couldn't pay his, his, his property tax because the river wrecked the bridge? Okay, so let's look at how we can make our bridge safe and sturdy. And then we implement what we're learning. And so he would learn to build the bridge. And then we'd all look back together and say, Nicolo, what were the tough times? And what did you learn when you hit a snag? And isn't that about life? What are the tough times? And what do you learn when you hit a snag? That's for preparation for life. I think, my friends, it can be a both end. I don't think it has to be an either or. I think there is value in children memorizing. Mem I have a lot of memories. I can quote poetry to you. I can quote statistics to you. I can quote research to you. And yet, that doesn't matter unless I can put it into context. Project-based learning gives each child an opportunity to place learning into context so that it makes sense to that child. When my son got it, that if he wanted to build a bridge, he needed to learn about physics. He wasn't necessarily learning about physics and memorizing things. No, he was learning about fulcrums. He was learning what makes something sturdy. He was learning what makes something last. And so let me ask you this. Let me ask you your best educational experience and your worst educational experience. Let's just see what was true for you. I've given you an example of being in law school and what was true for me, but have a look at this. Would you take a moment and just recall? Let's go on the right-hand side first. Who was your best teacher? When you walked into that teacher's classroom or that professor's classroom and you said, I can't wait to get here. What was that teacher doing? Can you just describe that teacher's behavior? How did you feel when you were in the presence of that teacher? And what did you learn about life? Because all learning isn't just about subject matter. It's about how do we live on earth in a way that's respectful of ourselves, respectful of each other? It's like project-based learning is about learning in community, all right? So if anyone's willing to type in, and then Preeti can tell me about your best teacher and what was it that that teacher did? And look at the second question. How did you feel in his or her presence? I love this. My math teacher in eighth grade made me fall in love with math. Look. She made me feel special, capable, and respected. There it is, my friends. And if anyone else pops up, I'm glad to hear that too, because look at the opposite, my friends. Look at your worst teacher. And what happened? I'm going to ask Preeti this too. Your worst teacher, the, per the teacher that you did not want to go in that person's classroom. You were afraid. You were ashamed. And let's talk about trauma. It was a trauma. It was frightening. You shut down when you went in that classroom because how you felt in that classroom was worried you were going to be shamed, worried you would be told you were wrong, worried you would be publicly embarrassed. I have a number of those teachers, including in law school, but I have them as elementary teachers too. I began school at age four because I saw all of my friends going to school and I was a year younger than they were, but I wanted to go. And so I managed to convince the headmistress that I was going to start school at age four. And she got very upset, but she said, all right, okay, all right, if I'll give you six weeks and if you can, can keep up, you can stay. If not, I do not wanna see you here for another year. I kept up, I did well but for one day. And what happened? I was out sick. I had a horrible sinus infection. Back in the day, we didn't know what a sinus infection was. We just knew that it hurt, it hurt your ears. I was out not just for a day, but for three days. When I came back in the classroom, the teacher, and I remember her name, said to me, Holly Elisa, you, you do that. You show us how this problem is solved. And I didn't know because I hadn't been in the class. And she was trying to show me that it was, if I were not in the class, I had to learn before I came to the class so that I could have memorized what I needed to. So what I did was I went blank inside. That was a traumatic experience. I felt like, how am I gonna know this? I don't know. 
my mind went blank. I was traumatized. And I'll tell you, even though I'm 75 years old, I remember that day. Do you remember your worst teacher when you felt ashamed, when you felt you didn't belong, when you felt you were, like Einstein said, stupid? Most of us do. And it's not pretty and it hurts a lot. And so why are we talking about enjoying playful learning? I'm not talking about like, oh, yeah, it's all fun and games. No, I'm talking about the exploration part of project-based learning. I'm talking about a teacher, like Preeti said, who engages us, who helps us feel like we've got strengths. When a teacher would engage my son, who is otherwise able, in other words, he's a special needs person, when a teacher would engage him, and help him see that he had something con to contribute, he would be brilliant. And when a teacher judged him by what he was able to memorize, he would just transport himself out of the classroom, make a ruckus, make a ruckus. Breathing next slide. And so what we're talking about here is, and what we're gonna talk about in our remaining time, which is about half an hour, well, no, I guess it's more than that. I'm grateful. We will be looking at what are our assumptions that we bring to how we learn? And look at this picture. What do you see, my friends, when you look at this picture? What's going on between the adult and the child? What's going on? And so let's look at, let's, let's dive deep. Never mind what the theory says. Never mind what we're told. That's valuable. But let's go deep and ask ourselves, based in our own experience, what really matters? And so let's look, let's look at and articulate, let's examine and articulate the assumptions we bring to learning. And then let's examine our brain's reaction and response to being threatened. If you don't get this right, if you can't pass this test, you're dumb, you're stupid. Or look at that child and say, you have mastered this particular lesson project so well. And you know, this next lesson is not making sense to you. Well, that's understandable. That's the way learning goes. How about we you help me understand what did you learn? What And little children can tell you what they've learned. They'll tell you what matters. It might be very literal or it might be very, um, you know, like, limited, but they will tell you and you will find, if you're a project-based learning person, you will find that there's something in that that you can build upon. So we're gonna look at the brain and honestly, back in the day when most of us were educated, the neuroscience was not available. Now we have neuroscience available. And so now the question to each of us, whether we're a parent educator, whether we're an educator is, what will help this child become happy, successful, fulfilled, and productive for the community, what will help that child become herself? And breathing next slide. And by the way, as I look at that child, I see a very different child than this one. When you look at this little guy, what do you, you know, when a child feels rejected or incorrect or he's shamed in the classroom, and that is trauma, that's traumatizing. That because traumatization and we'll look at a slide about this, is when our brains shut down. Literally, our brains, according to recent studies, only operate at 5 to 10% of our capacity. If we are humiliated in the classroom, if we feel stupid in the classroom, if we feel the classroom makes no sense, my son kept coming home and saying, Mom, it doesn't make sense. What? And we'd sit there and we'd talk about, okay, Nick, if you want to purchase something, how much do you need to pay for that? Well, it says right there, mom. Good, there's information. So how do, what money do you have? Okay, mom, I've got this, I've got that. Okay, Nick, is, does that amount equal what you wanna purchase? Hmm. And all of a sudden he's got to figure it out. And all of a sudden he cares about figuring it out. And all of a sudden the learning becomes real. I'm not saying every learning needs to be practical. I'm saying every learning needs to engage the child. So look at this child and as you look at him, 
what do you see? I see a child who's close, he's in contact, but he's not happy at all. He's not happy, but next slide, please. He's feeling like I don't belong here. And so look at what happens. And this is particularly, why do I talk about trauma? Because honestly, in India, all across India, in the United States, all across the United States, we have been and are continuing in many ways in trauma. What is trauma? It's a life-threatening event from the outside in that causes a reaction from the inside out. And when we're threatened, like for example, a child has a relative that's ill. Perhaps a child has a grandfather that's ill. And because of COVID, the child cannot go hug the grandfather. And because the grandfather is 93 years old, the grandfather is not comfortable being on Zoom or FaceTiming. What happens to the child? Trauma. Look at that baby's face. He is so attached to his grandmother or his grandfather, and he's never going to see that person again. So look what happens. It's not exploration like the child in the, in the next photograph. No, it is fear. Fear-based learning does not empower us to be lifelong learners. Fear-based learning empowers us to pass the test. What do we want for our children? Yes, to pass the test, but also to know how to negotiate life. So look what happens to children if they are traumatized. As I was traumatized in law school, I can tell you more examples of being put on the spot and humiliated because that was called the Socratic method, Socrates. You'd be quizzed and quizzed and quizzed until you made a mistake. I have a sister who's a psychiatrist. She was in medical school. Same thing happened to her. She was at a university called Johns Hopkins, and she the anatomy professor called her, made her stand up in front of the class. There are very few women who were doctors at the time and quizzed her and quizzed her on these slides, slide after slide. What's that? What's that? What's that? Until she made a mistake. And that was supposed to help her learn. I had a law professor who kept quizzing me until I was supposed to fail. I was so at that point in my 20s, so ha used to having through undergraduate education, which invited me to think and to understand and to use my emotional intelligence, I was able to partner with that professor who kept drilling me and to say, well, here's the next possibility. And finally, the professor had to say to me, you knock that ball out of the park, you know, the American baseball thing. He was saying to me, you got it. But the rest of the time in law school, I was terrified. I would be put in front of the class and embarrassed. Shame, as you'll see, Dr. Carl Jung said, shame is not a motivator. Shame is a soul killer. So let's look what to, happens to children when they get shamed in the classroom. Common adjustment reactions to either being shamed and humiliated in a classroom because they don't know the answer or when something else makes their brain shut down, like a child does not understand why he or she cannot see her grandmother, loves the grandmother, grandmother loves the child, needs to hug, needs to touch, needs to be physically present. And this happened across the world. Grandparents died, is terribly sad. Relatives died and the child could not say goodbye. We will be having trauma in these folk for years until we help ourselves and help them. <sighs> Essentially do project-based learning about what happened. Yes, we lost Nona. Why did we lose her? She had a disease called cancer. What is cancer? How does cancer act? Will I get cancer? Will you get cancer? Let's look today, right now, what are some of the studies being done on cancer? Let's explore, let's plan. Let's look at understanding the world. So here's what happens when a child feels rejected, ashamed of herself, abandoned, excluded from the classroom or in danger, or because the world, like with COVID, gives children the message, life isn't safe, you can't go out the door. If you live in a 13 story building, you're not even supposed to go up and down the elevator. For the, yes, because you are going to possibly contact or contract the disease. How many of you had to homeschool? And for how many of you is that really hard? Because children don't want to just sit still. 
They want to be engaged. And if I were to use two words for project-based learning, it's being inspired and being engaged. Being inspired is, is either by the subject matter itself and or it's by the teacher. And the teacher is so engaged with that child that the teacher knows what's going to bring life to that threatened baby's face. Because if I don't know each child, if I simply teach each child as if she is, we call it in the law, fungible, you know, like jelly beans or beans, they all look alike, they all learn alike, and oh, how many of you have had children and each child is radically different? I have a daughter who's a chemical engineer. My son is not a chemical engineer. My son has a great deal of trouble with school. My daughter's a chemical engineer. Is either one better than the other? Well, some would say yes. I would say I love them both because both of them are on earth. Both of them are valuable. How can we help the child who has the hard time? And how can we partner with the child that for whom learning is easy? Look what will happen even to the child like my daughter who did really well in school. If she got put on the spot and embarrassed, the child doesn't blame the teacher. No, if a child is traumatized, who does she blame? Herself. She believes it's my fault, it's my mistake. And what did this child start doing? Acting out. My son started getting attention in other ways. He was trying to say to the teachers, look, this isn't working, but he didn't have the words for that. So he'd cause a ruckus and no one wants a ruckus in the classroom. So he got put into special classes. So notice that what happens if a child does not feel welcome, if a child does not feel something inside of her is worthy of being connected to learning, a child is going to blame herself. And then what happens? Look at all these things. Children have trouble sleeping. Have you seen that? They have trouble eating or they overeat or they lose their appetite. All of a sudden, they bring worries and anxiety into the world. They're not full of awe. They're full of fear. They have difficulties concentrating because they're worried. As I was in law school, as my sister was in medical school, I'm going to get called on it. I'm going to be ashamed. I've got to, you know, it was always about managing my image, not about learning. And then there's the uh, somatization, which have you ever seen a child who says, I got a stomach ache or I got a headache, but they don't have a fever and they don't have any other indicators. But what, what are they really saying? What are they really saying? They're saying, this classroom is making me sick. This world is making me sick. Preeti, next slide, please. Look at all the areas of child development that are touched when children are not engaged in learning, when children in, on the other side are ashamed, are taught that what's inside of them doesn't matter. What matters is that they learn from the outside in. It affects their physical development. It affects their ability to moderate their emotions. It affects, look at Liz, with my son, behavioral control. It even affects attachment. If a child looks at a teacher and the teacher is shaming the child, what's that child going to feel about trust for future teachers and excitement about, next slide, please, breathing, and excitement about learning? After all, don't we want to become lifelong learners? Haven't you made it through life? Hasn't the successes in your life come? because you were able in that moment to bring the best of yourself to each situation, to pull upon what you had learned and, what, and pull upon what you needed to learn. I mean, Einstein also said, I never, I never memorize anything that I can look up or research. He didn't wanna fill his brain with all that stuff. He wanted his brain to be alive, active, and as project-based learning says, exploring. So here's my question to you. And I'm going to ask Preeti this, to be free to learn, what do traumatized, and if that word is too strong, what do children who are afraid they're going to fail, what do they most need from us adults? And as Preeti is reflecting on that, I'm going to say, look, here's a quote, the rain will stop, the night will end, the hurt will fade. Hope is never so lost that it can't be found. What do, that's one thing that children need. What else do, besides hope, Preeti, for a child to be able to learn, if a child has had a difficult time in a classroom, maybe feeling like this teacher doesn't think I'm bright, she thinks I'm stupid. 
What do you think helps a child get back on the path to being a lifelong learner? I'd say that they like being valued, I think, is critical for children to have the trust with the bonding. And then when they know that they're valued, probably then they're able to build up on the, the rest of their skills. Beautiful. Thank you. Because Preeti just said something that I believe you may have said when I asked the question, who was your best teacher? Your best teacher is the one who sees the promise in you, especially when the promise in you is different than anybody else. So many people that we've had that are geniuses were not seen as geniuses. They were seen as failures. And so what do children need? They need, and this comes from a neuroscientist, they need to feel safe. They need to feel, and next slide please, Preeti. They need to feel that in the classroom, someone is going to make sure that they feel welcome, that their particular learning style is welcome. And without the safety, a child can't learn. There's a lot of research on this, my friends. If a child is afraid of going into the classroom, afraid of being humiliated, afraid of not being enough, the child's gonna avoid the classroom with all those symptoms we just talked about. I was speaking with Dr. John Medina, who's one of the, the authors of the ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which looks at children, so many children, what a, what a vast number of children who have been traumatized either in the classroom or by life events. And honestly, it can just take one life event if a child is in a burning house. That puts the child's brain on edge forever unless the child returns to safety. One of the primary things we need to do, and I ask you this, when you're with your children and you want them to learn something, how do you help them feel safe? And Preeti's right. We build relationship with each child so that the child feels like, I've got something to offer. Next slide, Preeti. Yes, and so Dr. John Medina, when I asked him the question, what do children need more than anything else? I thought he was going to say relationship, unconditional love, being accepted. He did, but what he said comes first is safety. So if you're a teacher, what are all the things you're doing with that child to help that child feel you're welcome here, you're safe here. I am not going to try to annihilate you by embarrassing you. The old fashioned theory came out of Prussia was we shame people, we embarrass them. And then they're so embarrassed and so ashamed that they're afraid that they're gonna get ashamed again. And so they're gonna learn everything. Guess what? We now know from the neuroscientists that if we are afraid all the time, our brain is not able to learn. So what is the bottom line we need to offer children? We need to offer them the hope and to help them feel hopeful that whoever they are and however long it takes them to learn something, they're worthy. Next slide. They are worthy because if you got hope, you got everything. So look, um, Preeti, I'm going to ask you to read this. This is to Fred Rogers. Now, Fred Rogers, as many of you know, is an early educator. He was the first person to Zoom learning, basically, for children. And he is looking at times, because the topic here is, is trauma and playfulness. How, in difficult times, can we help children learn? And so Fred Rogers answered the question, what do frightened children need from adults to be able to learn during the pandemic or during a class when they feel like, I'm not good at math, what can I do? Preeti, can you tell us, starting with at many times, what Fred Rogers said children need? At many times, children will feel the world has turned topsy-turvy. It's not the ever-present smile that will help them feel secure. It's knowing that love can hold many feelings, including sadness, and that they can count on the people they love to be with them until the world turns upside again, right side up again. And Preeti, does that feel true to you in any way? Absolutely. And this is not just in the context of learning. I think it's just in, in life itself, this is so true. Thank you. And guess what? Thank you for saying that. And we'll go to the next slide because guess what? We are helping children become lifelong learners. Projects, working a project, learning how to deal with problem solving, 
learning how to call in our own resources. And when I don't know something, being able to call in other people, I could not on my own figure out law school. But when I sat with like five other people and each one of us looked at a case and we said, well, here's what I see. No, here's what, and here's what I see. And we put it together and it made sense. And so what are we talking about with project-based learning? We're talking about, and here's the question, my friends, if you're a teacher or if you're a parent educator, or in your own life, like Preeti just said, how can we engage in our learning? What do we need to have? And here's a group, the Life is Good Foundation. They're in Boston. And if you've ever seen those shirts that say life is good and they've got people happy doing what they're doing, guess what? They've done research on what are the qualities that are necessary for people to learn, children to learn and adults. And here they are. This is based upon how the brain works how the body works, because if the body is tense, we're too tight to take in information. If the brain is fearful, we're shut down. And so what do we need? We need to have a sense of agency, a sense of inner control. We need to feel like we have the right to choose, to explore what is a quality of project-based learning. It is exploration. My son wants to build a bridge, he wants to build a bridge across a creek. So he doesn't have to get his feet wet. Beautiful, what a great idea. So how do we build a bridge? He gets to choose what he wants to work on. He doesn't care. He's not interested in memorizing the states of the United States. That doesn't matter to him, but how to get across a bridge, that's lifelong learning. Isn't that a metaphor? How do we make a bridge to get across the tough things? The second quality we need and ask, the, ask yourself, back to the teacher that helped you, all of these things were in present in that classroom with that teacher. All of the things that help you as an adult get excited about something, you have the freedom to explore without fear. You have joy. The child, remember the baby that we had in the first slide? That child has a natural curiosity and awe and wonder. I'm going to be 76 in a few weeks. I've got the curiosity and the wonder of a child. Einstein had the wonder of a child his whole life. And that's how he kept creating. Gandhi kept being given one problem after another, after another, and slammed down. And, and I was in Pune. I was in Pune, where Gandhi was, in, you know, he was put in house prison. It's where his wife died. It was heartaching to go there. It was, a, in its own way, a beautiful place, but he was... He, his joy was clamped down, and yet what did he do? He kept returning to hope. He kept returning to feeling like we can solve this problem together, and he did. He changed the world. So we've got to have a sense of, of the freedom to ex explore, freedom to choose, continue to have that wonder of a child, and to help each other. It's taken me a long time, it, 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 because here's my upbringing, very traditional upbringing was, do this yourself. You must be all things to all people. You must be able to solve this yourself. As a leader, as a dean of faculty, I've, I was, was thinking, I've got to do this myself. Well, guess what? No, we have to be in connection with other people. How many problems can we solve without knowing how to connect with other people? Very, very few. In fact, I can't think of any right now. Almost everything needs to be in community. And the last thing we need is what we've been talking about, hope. And what does hope mean? It means, we're going to talk about that, but what hope essentially means, and Preeti mentioned this up front, hope essentially means that we believe that we can find something valuable in ourself, no matter how much, and look at this picture on the right, no matter how much the darkness falls and we can't see, no matter how scared we are and we can't see, when we connect with each other, that other person will help us find the light. Uh, next slide, Preeti. <laughs> Have you ever felt like that? Like you're being thrown into something and you, ah, ah, next slide, please. <sighs> That's a whole different thing than looking at yourself and saying, I'm braver than I think I am. I'm stronger than I can imagine. And sometimes children look at adults like the kitten looks at the lion and says, oh, that person knows everything. What are we helping the child learn? Child, 
Trust yourself. You are learning. You're valuable and you're growing. Next slide, Preeti. Here it is, my friends. This is the example of what happens. Shame, fear, humiliation, traditional education, which puts the child on the spot and requires children to pass tests, that drains our brains of functionality. Hope, respect, understanding, that helps our brains reframe so that they can be highly functional. If we frighten a child, if we shame a child, look what happens on the right-hand side and that luscious red color, that's blood flowing throughout the brain. If a child is made to feel like, well, you can't pass this test, you're not smart. John Kennedy Jr. in this country never passed the bar examination. He was never able to practice law. What did he do? He became a journalist. However, did people say he was dumb? Yeah, couldn't climb a tree. Not dumb because you fail the bar exam. You just don't know how to take standardized tests. Do we want people in life as our leaders who know how to take standardized tests? Or do we want people that know how to solve problems, everyday human problems? Or like Gandhi, everyday human problems that make a difference to everybody. That's what I'm looking for. So look what happens. If we, if we shame a child, if we expect a child to fit into something that doesn't fit the child, the blood in the child's brain, this is true for adults too, drains rapidly. So rapidly we get pale in the face. We Sometimes we faint because we're so terrified. All of the blood is going to, into our autonomic system, that primitive part of ourself that only knows how to survive. If you've been in the classroom, and I, like I was a four-year-old in the classroom and the teacher was quizzing me and I didn't know the answer because I had been sick. I had been out of school. My brain collapsed, collapsed, and I couldn't think straight. Now look, that's what we do to children if we hold them to a standard that is impossible, that only a certain number of children, like Dr. Daniel Goleman says, only 20% of children are going to be able to do this typical traditional type of learning. Every other child is going to need to find her own way to make sense of things. I am one of those children that had to find her own way to make sense of things. Are you? Are you? Look at the left-hand side. Here's what happens with project-based learning. The child feels like, I'm acceptable. I have something to offer. My own interests are going to make a difference here. I want to build a bridge. And the, and the teacher is saying, that's a really great idea. Where the teacher is saying, tell me why you want to do that. Tell me what's of interest to you. Well, I don't want to get my feet wet. Okay. And so what, would it, what do you need? Well, I need to be above the water. Well, what if the water gets higher? Well, that's right. I need to think about that. All of those questions are intriguing to the child who, who doesn't want to get his feet wet. And guess what happens? Look at the blood. It flows freely. And if you'll take a moment here to put your hand on your forehead, you will touch the most recently developed part of your brain. Most recently developed means centuries and centuries and eons and eons. But this is called, this is the prefrontal cortex that's behind your forehead. It's also called appropriately your executive function. What are we doing with children and what are we doing the rest of our life? We're helping them develop this part of their brains because this part of the brain is the part that has perspective, that's a part that allows them to be creative, to come up with new ideas, to be optimistic and to be hopeful. Einstein had this part of his brain going on all the time. And that's how he was able to come up with these wild theories because he was operating on all cylinders. The child who's on the right-hand side, whose brain is being drained of energy, that child is gonna be think it's she's stupid the rest of her life. But if we can instead inspire and engage a child, those two words, play-based play -based learning and project-based learning, inspire and engage, then the blood will flow. Let's go to the next slide, Preeti. And also, Preeti, if you can let me know how much time we have left, that would be helpful. And as she's doing that, let's look at how much time, sweetie, five minutes? Okay, so we're gonna jump ahead some slides, but look at this. Thunder strikes in our brains when we feel trauma. And the trauma could be a teacher saying, oh, you didn't get that. You need to study. That can traumatize a child. Or the trauma can be 
putting the child in a group of lesser performing children. That happened to my son all the time. Or a trauma can be lightning striking. It all feels the same in the brain. It's a threat. When the brain is threatened, it can't think straight. How do we co-create sanctuaries where we can learn? And so the question here is when thunder has struck you as an adult, let's go as an adult, something has terrified you, perhaps something with COVID has terrified you. I'll tell you, <laughs> as a self-supporting person, my livelihood depends upon writing books and, and it also depends upon speaking around the world. COVID came. Every single one of my keynotes in every country was canceled. All of my income, therefore, was canceled. Thunderstruck, I thought, oh my God, how am I gonna support myself? And so that was scary. But also, and what's missing from this slide is not only what hurts and scares us, but what helps us restore. And you know what I did in that moment? I said to the divine, whatever the divine is or isn't, I said, I'm going to trust. I'm gonna do two things. Rather than be fear-based, I'm gonna be hope-based. Next slide, Preeti. And I'm going to say, I'm gonna trust that I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna trust that I will find work. And also I'm gonna do something even more so, because I've always had a sliding, sliding scale for clients. If they can afford, I work. If they can't afford, I work because I love what I do. So I do this sliding scale. And so I just decided I was gonna pay it forward and give it away. And guess what? Oh, sure, my income hasn't been what it would have been if I were traveling the world giving keynotes, but I've gotten through and I've gotten through happily. Here's what happens to the brain, my friends, if a child is traumatized in the classroom or outside, start with the red. When the lightning strikes, the child feels anxious. Oh my God, I can't, I'm not safe in this classroom. And what does the child wanna do? Goes to the green light. Let me get out of here, let me escape. And children do something called dissociating. They leave the classroom behind. Have you ever done that? I mean, the most acceptable way is to daydream. But then it gets as serious as dissociating. Children dissociate, which means they leave their bodies behind because it's too painful to be in that classroom. It's too painful to be in that situation. They leave, they disconnect. And then they're out of touch with their feelings. And feelings are the basis of so much information. We cut ourselves off from our feelings, we cut ourselves off from learning. And so what happens next? We, we get scared, we need to escape, we feel relief briefly, but then guess what? Our brains get into a repetitive cycle. Oh my God, if I go back in the classroom, I'm gonna get scared again. Have you known children that avoid the classroom? Have you known children that avoid going to tests? Have you know, known adults that avoid doing certain things in their lives? Next slide, because that's what happens to our brain. And this, and actually we'll make these slides available to you. If it gets really intense and a child isn't helped, the child like me can develop complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And that is where, look at all these things happen. We have trouble building a trust in ourselves. We have trouble believing that people won't hurt us. We have trouble, we have flashbacks, memories of scary things. Next slide, this is not the way we want a child to learn. And here's the point from Carl Jung. Shame, if we shame a child instead of lift a child up and through project-based learning, engage and inspire a child, shame is a soul-eating emotion. The people that you admire, I ask you right now, consider whom do you admire most? It might be a person in your family, it might be a person we all know, whom do you admire most? Well, I admire Gandhi. Why? Because he didn't quit. Because he listened to his own knowledge and combined it with the knowledge of folk around him. And he came up just as with project-based learning with a plan to help him to continue to explore and continue to problem solve. Life is a continuous problem to solve, but when we're not ashamed about it, life is a continuous adventure. Next slide a continuous adventure of learning. And so here's my question to you, and we're just about out of time. Uh, next slide with the, hit it one more time. Oops, no, I'm sorry. I don't know why that next slide didn't show up. It's okay, we'll skip that one. But the point is, which is more inspiring to learning? Is it to be hope-based or fear-based? And look what this man said. 
may I have, this is uh, John O'Donohue. He said, may I have the courage today to postpone my dream no longer, but do at last what I came here for and waste my heart on fear no more. As we get ready to wrap and we look back, can you remember something that you really loved and wanted to learn about so much? And you stopped being afraid. You didn't have to waste your heart on being afraid or embarrassed that you couldn't get it right. You said instead, I've got something inside of myself that's a dream. Like my son wanted to know how to build a bridge. What a lifetime beautiful experience that could be. Because life is about building bridges, yeah? And if a teacher can see that, this child wants to build a bridge. This child wants to learn how to help someone who can't learn, learn. What a lifelong learning process that is. There needs to be compassion. The assumption we had, back to the original consequences, ideas we had for this, this our time together, which is ending. Next slide, Preeti. Um, is this. We believed that learning came from the outside out, in. But what we know now from the neuroscience is unless we are at home within ourselves, we can't learn. And some of you may know this early childhood story. It's from the Lorax, Dr. Zeus, unless someone like you cares a whole awful not, nothing's gonna get better, it's not. Next slide. Truth is, unless you are the person that is willing to step up and say, how do children learn? How do adults learn? It's not by scaring them or humiliating them. It's not by traumatizing them. It's by looking to each person, person as Preeti said, connecting with the person, helping that person find her strengths, and that will give the courage, the person courage, to be able to see I can make a mistake. And when I make a mistake, that does not mean I am a mistake. I love this. I love this, this saying. It's only a mistake if I don't learn something from it. But this is gonna require change, my friends, and change is difficult. And so look at this. Who's the only person that likes change? Who's the only person that likes to change the way we teach and the way we learn? Hit that next pointer. It's a baby with a wet diaper. That's the only person on earth that really likes change. If you're gonna change the way we teach and the way we learn, it's going to mean embracing the way we really learn. It's going to mean looking at the neuroscience of how we learn. And next slide, Preeti. In fact, every child deserves one adult who believes that that child is the most marvelous, gifted, and lovable, and that my son would learn exponentially when someone paid attention to him. People said he'll never read. Hired a tutor that got him. Over the summer, he learned to read. He's an avid reader. Next slide, Preeti. I'm looking for the slide. Ah, there's the message. Be curious, not judgmental. Don't shut people down by judging them. Invite them through project-based learning to be curious to explore. Preeti, I'm looking for the slide. Please jump ahead to where it says hope. It's a keep going. Okay, that's great. We'll end with the next slide. This one says hope means hold on pain ends. But here's, this is what I'm going to conclude with because hope is what we all need to get through hard times. Hope is what we all need to get through our educational time. We need to believe that we're gonna be able to do it. And so let's look, what does hope have to do with learning and what does it have to do with project-based learning? If you take the four letters of the word hope, word hope, the last person just said hope, it's in an acronym, hold on pain ends. I'm gonna invite you right now as we're closing out. If you were to take the letter H, the letter O, the letters in blue and write what learning at its best means to you, what would you fill in for that letter H? What would you fill in for O, for P, for E? The person before said, hold on, pain ends. I'm going to leave you with this. I believe that to learn, I have to have a sense of humor. And guess what? We know from brain research that when we laugh, when we lighten up, when we play, when we explore, our brains relax and they're open to learning. If we simply, if we simply smile, even if it's a fake smile for one minute, that sets off endorphins because our, our face gets the message, wait a minute, we, we are happy. 
And so humor is part of it, being lighthearted, being willing to say, I made a mistake, what the hey? My son used to say, he'd look at me when he made, when he couldn't do something and he'd say, silly me. And so the rest of my life, I said, silly me. If I make a mistake, that doesn't mean I am a mistake. The second thing about learning, originality, go to each child and find that child's way of learning. There are all kinds of different styles of learning. Some children need to be hands-on. Some children need to hear it. Some people need to see it. Some people need to talk with other people about it. Go to each child's originality. The third is perspective. We're going to lose sight. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to have trouble. How can we help the child lift up above and remember what's important? Remember that, for example, we don't have to be perfect. We just have to do our best. And the last thing that children always need, it's not shaming. It's not debilitating. It's not testing to tell them one person is superior to another. No, it's encouragement. You're on this earth. You're here to contribute. We want you to contribute. We're going to find the best in you. Preeti, thank you so much for inviting me. I hope you found this helpful. And, and when you get these slides, they will have all kinds of other information on them about the brain. But my bottom line is, Preeti, engage the child, help the child feel inspired, and help the child feel like you matter. Because when a child feels like she matters, she's got the confidence to learn. And when the child feels like, nope, you can't pass this test, you're not bright, the child feels like, I have nothing to offer. That's not what we want. My child, my son has things to offer the, the world. And yet many people didn't have the confidence in him. Those that did helped him find his way. May you be that person. Thanks. How beautiful, Molly. I'm just so inspired. So, so blessed to have heard you this time again. For me, the biggest takeaway is that very often we make learning something that's so intellectual, something so cognitive. But listening to you today and, and before this also, every time that I've interacted with you, you talk about learning from a very social, emotional development space. You talk about it as as the emotion, the, the, the joy of learning, the hope that you spoke so much about, being so critical to learning. And that has been a, the greatest takeaway for me because project-based learning and hope go hand in hand. And I think that's so beautifully put through this last hour that you've spoken. So thank you so much for that. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you. We will look forward to more insights from you in the coming months, years as well. Thank so you, everybody. You. Thank you so much, Preeti. Wishing no you happiness and take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.